Hey there, this is John. Welcome to the Breakthrough Creative, where we talk about the business of art and the art of business. Uh, I've finally done enough episodes where I think I can rattle that off without having to re-record it a bunch of times. Uh, I don't know how much I've shared on the show about my background in airbrushing, uh, but I started making a living airbrushing t-shirts. And Around the time I was doing that, which would have been about 1989, I ended up uh, finding this trade magazine. Uh, it was it was entertaining and it was also informative, and you know it had a, a, a lot of resources in it for airbrushing in general, but but particular to airbrushing T-shirts. You see, my whole thing was. I didn't want to make a living working for anybody else. And I certainly didn't want to make a living that didn't involve art. And I had this airbrush and so I started figuring it out. And there was this guy in an airbrush shop locally, but he wouldn't share any info with me. He didn't want any competition, which I guess was smart. I don't know. It, it, it seemed kind of weird at the time to me even. But um, anyway, long and the short of it, is in the Airbrush Action magazine, that was the name of the magazine, uh, there were these articles about t-shirt shops and how these t-shirt shops were run and the designs they used. And then there might be attached to that article about a particular person, a how-to, and they would walk you through all the technique that went into a particular design. And Somebody who was really, really uh, an astute communicator and writer and struck me as a businessman was Pat Gaines. And Pat Gaines had made something more out of airbrushing t-shirts than, you know, just an artist sitting in a corner in a t-shirt shop somewhere, which is actually how I made quite a bit of money just doing that. But he took it to the next level and he he would have these shops that were like displays of of this juicy looking artwork, this airbrush artwork in the middle of malls. And he didn't just have one shop. He had multiple shops and he had a partner and I mean, a true a true businessman. And I never spoke with the guy before um several months ago and we happened to be in the same forum together and we got connected and I asked him if he would be my guest on the show and so he is you're going to hear from Pat in just a minute but as a primer I want you to listen to the guy I want you to listen to to how uh, smart he has been around business and how he sees opportunities and kind of how generous he is with his information I mean, it's just a really smart businessman and a really smart artist. And it's just amazing where he has uh, brought not just the craft of airbrushing t-shirts, but how he has seen the opportunity to turn it into um, a larger business. So, when you know, when we talk about the business of art and the art of business, Pat kind of sums it up. So let's get into the interview. Hey, John, I'm an airbrush t-shirt artist, presently, <laughs> one, one of my many vocations, but uh, this has been the foundation of what I've done all my life. Uh, around this spring, many other opportunities of entrepreneurship, which basically grew out of understanding and business uh, that I did with this. Uh, my parents, of course, were retail people also, so coming up, I was always punching a cash register if not taking quarters to get in the Coke machine, uh, I started then bringing up customers at some point <laughs> instead of, instead of looting the, when I was six years old, looting the cash register for dimes to buy Cokes. So it came up in a retail family. Uh, when I got to art school at Ringling School of Art and Design in Sarasota, uh, uh, just so happened an acquaintance of mine was airbrushing t-shirts in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And, uh, this fellow that owned that store in Gatlinburg was opening a store in Panama City Beach and they needed an airbrush artist. So he didn't want to ask his friends at the school because they knew that he was doing pretty well with it and he didn't want to upset anybody. So he asked somebody he really didn't know that well, which just happened to be me who lived next door to him. 
And he said, you are, you know, had airbrush t-shirts. And I had done a little bit of it in high school, just playing around with it. And I said, yes. And he said, but not really. And he said, well, don't worry about it. I'll teach you before you head off to Panama City Beach on Memorial Day weekend, which for about 10 minutes, he did that the day before I was to leave to go to Panama City Beach, Florida. I picked up the most expensive airbrush I could buy in Tampa at our supply store, which happened to be a like a, a Pache Turbo, which was an illustration airbrush, but it cost the most. So I figured, oh, that's the airbrush I need. So I wind up in Panama City Beach with this illustration airbrush. <laughs> it was horrible. But by the first week, you know, I made a hundred, two hundred dollars. And at the time I was 19 years old and oh my gosh, that's a lot of money. And by the end of the first month, I was doing really good. And I went home with, you know, $5,000 in my pocket at the end of the summer. My parents had no idea what I must be doing to make that kind of money. So I'd been in art school at that point for about two years with two more years to go. And I said to them, I said, you know, I, I, I have a job. I'm an artist now. I don't really think I need to go back to school and waste everybody's money. I can do this. My father just happened to be managing a shopping mall at the time. So I said, why don't I just set up in dad's mall and I can do that uh, for Christmas. And so I did. And then after Christmas, there was a traveling arts and crafts show I hooked up with and started doing that before I went back to Panama City Beach the following spring to start that over again the following summer. And that's the progression over the course of the next four or five years. And then, you know, got the... Uh, entrapments of success, a house and a car and so forth, had to keep doing this. And I ended up in Colorado in the winter times. Uh, this is when I start to tr strategize a little bit more, doing things on my own, following the tourists because they really did buy this stuff. And so we figured we need to go to the ski resorts in Colorado in the winter time. So we didn't have to travel so much with arts and craft shows and stuff. And I did that for a number of years, along with then going back to Panama City Beach in the, in the spring. And so a decade goes by, and then I decide that Panama City Beach is overrun with airbrush artists. When I started there, there was literally only about three or four people doing it. When I left there, there were 300 people doing it. It had become what we call the mecca of airbrush t-shirt painting, the North Florida coast. And uh, I figured I needed to be someplace else before this all kind of blew up on itself. And so I moved to back to Illinois and started opening stores and shopping malls. And we had the business name then was West Coast Airbrush. And over the course of the next uh, 10 or so years, we opened about uh, 30 stores altogether in shopping malls throughout the Midwest, about seven, six states. And uh, had that for about uh, 20 years total. Uh, and then I ventured into other businesses and um, malls started to wane in popularity. So came back to airbrushing along with some other business I have, but came back to airbrushing. And then the next obvious place to work airbrushing would be instead of shopping malls would be Walmart. So the business uh, went that direction with a, with a colleague of mine who had an airbrush shop in Walmart in Panama City Beach. So I was asked to, by him to, to work with him on opening more Walmart stores. And the obvious place to do it was in very popular tourist locations and the place we had our eye on the most was Orlando and Kissimmee uh, around Walt Disney World and Universal Studios. Now they didn't need us obviously these are the busiest Walmarts in the world but we had to uh, make sure they understood why they needed us and uh, and we talked them into it and now here we are. We have three stores in Kissimmee and in Orlando the closest one being only a mile from Walt Disney World, uh, World Drive, and the other one being a few miles away, and then the other one being only about a mile, about actually about six blocks from Universal Studios. So essentially every one, I don't know what the ratio might be of the 77 million people a year that come to Orlando on vacation, end up in one of these three Walmarts, but I would say without question, it's probably the second, other than the two parks, is probably the third busiest threshold in Orlando Kissimmee where people actually cross through a doorway or a, or a turnstile to get in. Other than Walt Disney World and Universal Studios, Walmart is certainly probably the third busiest threshold. So we put ourselves in a place where uh, families and children come and airbrushing 
I don't care what anybody says about it. Little kids love it. They always will love it. It's magic to them. It's the magic drawing board. It's the Esther sketch. It's whatever you want to say, but it's magic and they love it. And they're always amazed by it. And parents, nostalgic, will love it because they got it probably when they were a kid on vacation someplace. So they want to introduce their children to it and see that wonder in their eye and get that fun little shirt with a little monkey on it or a little teddy bear or a little duck or, you know, it's all very cliche and and kind of catchy, but hey, it's innocent and it's, it's wholly American what we do. And it's fun and it doesn't cost very much. They get to write what they want on their shirt what they do, what they like, the colors they like. It's all personal. So how can you go wrong with an airbrush t-shirt? Everybody needs a little airbrush t-shirt, airbrushing in their life, I think, you know. Absolutely. Point. And I'm, yeah. I'm a big fan. You know, my background is, is yeah. an airbrush and I made my first uh, minor fortune airbrushing t-shirts. I'm, I'm <laughs> wondering what, um, what was your pitch to Walmart? How, how did you convince them? Well, the, the entire front of Walmart in this town, Kissimmee and Orlando, is nothing but Disney and Universal Studios shirts. So you can buy a Disney shirt at it's Disney and pay $30 for it, or you can come to Walmart and pay $12 for it. They're not exactly the same shirts, but the tourists really, unless you're a Disney file, you probably wouldn't know the difference. So, okay. Uh, so they have literally millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of sales every year in Disney shirts. And the back of every single Disney shirt is blank. Why? Well, they don't need to put something on both sides of a Mickey Mouse shirt for it to sell. Customers will buy it with just one Mickey Mouse on the front. So they don't need to put anything on the back. Why charge, you know, spend more money? No reason. Okay, so the back, the back of all these shirts are blank. So we go to Walmart and say, do you realize that the back of every single Disney shirt or every Disney, every single Universal Studio shirt is blank and that is the canvas that we work on so if you sell that shirt for $12 imagine that we could have the customer spend another $12 on the same t-shirt so now the t-shirt you're currently selling for $12 it sells now for $24 how, how else can you do that and how many shirts a year do you sell millions do the math it's it doesn't take long for somebody to say yeah how fast can you come, you know, and start doing this? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's just one of those things kind of like in plain sight, but you don't see it until you do. And then you do, <laughs> you do it. Right. You can't unsee it once you see it. You can't No, exactly. You cannot unsee it. The opportunity and, uh, so, is vast. It is. So basically all you have to do is get the people to see it, the customer, and to then want it. And everybody, you can go through the parks and walk around the parks and you see everybody with these shirts on the, you know, the Jones family vacation, the Jones Diz family Disney vacation. They all wear it. A lot of them get it before they come. If they don't get it before they come to Orlando, they see other families wearing it and they go, oh, we should have got those before we came because they'll get the same color of shirt, for example. And they stand out in a crowd of a billion people, right? That's in the park. So if nothing else, they can keep track of all their group because they all have the same bright color shirt on. Okay, so, but they forgot to do it. And so where can we get those now? Oh, guess what? They can do it at Walmart. They can make them for you like now. So let's go get 20 of them, right? And you got that too. And then, oh, let's put it on the back of a Disney shirt while we're at it. And buy 24 Disney shirts while we're at it. And yeah, so there you go. It, it was clear, uh, the, 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 basically, the direction that we used for the, the Walmart uh, suggestion that this is something that they might want to do. And, uh, and they did. So. And, and so, like, this is a, a culmination, really, of your career, right? I mean, to, to, to get this space in this shop and, and the other shops that you have in the other Walmarts, because it's uh, the traffic is built in. It's a real impulse buy. It's very attractive. And, and you've really, you've been doing this your whole career. Correct. No, it, it is the combination of what I'm doing in this particular business. No question. Now I wouldn't have came into this 
Walmart had it not been for a colleague of mine, Mark Rush, who basically had a business inside Walmart since 1990. So actually airbrushing has been in Walmart under this brand for 37 years, however, okay, for however long that time frame is. I didn't, <laughs> 37 years, something like that. Anyway, so uh, yeah, it's not new to Walmart. No, and, and however, uh, it just became uh, clear that there were other opportunities. And Mark saw it and he contacted me right at the right time where I was selling another business and I was retiring basically. And he said, would you consider doing this with me and we'll look for other Walmarts. And then, like I said earlier, the off Orlando op, uh, op option was clear where we wanted to do it. It was them just convincing Walmart that this is something they want to do. But, uh, but with that, um, knowledge that I had gained and experience I had gained over, you know, like it's like, like I said before, I'd been doing it by that time by for probably 35 years uh, and other businesses as well. But I was able to then put all that in play when it came to, to doing this in Walmart. Uh, but I had a lot of help along the way. Uh, so, and, and also with Walmart, uh, Mark had a lot of experience with Walmart. I then also, uh, hired a ex Walmart manager to be my uh, to be my assistant, and she end, ended up becoming my partner in business. And she's a 25 year Walmart manager. Her name's Karen Bellman, and she now is my partner in business. And uh, she manages all the Walmart interaction. And uh, because you don't know what you don't know until you don't know it, and I don't know anything about Walmart, and she knows. And her husband is also a 25 year Walmart manager. So between the two of them, they have 50 years of Walmart. I needed that because if anything goes awry, it, it's not good. So anything that goes awry that I couldn't fix, she could, and I knew that. So, so you got a partner who, I mean, is obviously good at what she does, but it's she's also an insurance policy. Correct. It's it's uh, Walmart is like a government. It's the bureaucracy is huge and. And you have to basically, like businesses, will will hire lobbyists to work with them. Know the ins and outs. Know the how it all works. And Karen essentially is is our lobbyist, one of her roles. Uh, and you just name it. I mean, and plus she has the uh, capability of being a, a manager that manages hundreds and hundreds of people on the staff of any given Walmart, plus a multi-million dollar business, which is any given Walmart. 25 years of that. So to bring her into a, a, an operation like this is for her is like nothing. And, uh, and she, she manages it very well with me and she gives us a lot of input on things that we don't see that she does. You need an outside person to basically be looking in from the outside and say, well, what about this? And what about that? You know, cause we get, you get complacent. Anybody does. So that person from the outside looking at us is very important. And also seeing it from a Walmart standpoint. So let's let's like take a step back from from your business and take take a look at you know where you've come from as as an artist and as a business person. I guess that the the initial thing that goes through my mind is how do I get from me airbrushing a T-shirt to getting into a mall somewhere or, or in front of some people to sell them my one t-shirt to then like where you're at right now, you've got a business where you employ artists to paint. You've got, uh, you know, hundreds of designs in there. You've got all kinds of product. It, it's not just about the airbrush skill and the, the painting it onto the shirt and having a couple of shirts there. I mean, there's a whole lot that goes in to your, I mean, I'll call it a system because you have to have a system to do what it is that you do. How do you even get started <laughs> on that path? Well, keep in mind, John, that the airbrushing thing when I started was a pretty loose young person's game in regards to the people that were doing it. We were all kind of learning on the fly as we went. Uh, we, we There were some other people doing it prior to us. Another one of my partners in business for the West Coast Airbrush was Tom Davidson. And Tom Davidson was one of the people that you would arguably was one of the founders of the whole art form. There were others 
that he was mentored by, including Ed Roth, Big Daddy Ed, Brad, Big Ed Roth, uh, Jeff Jeffries, uh, I don't, uh, so on, okay. And Tom was uh, mentored by these fellows, the, the creators of this art form, and truthfully the creators of almost the multi-billion dollar, God only knows trillion dollar business that is all in print sportswear. All started actually with a t-shirt airbrush guy uh, or a magic marker on a shirt, filling it in with a spray can. Those are the very early things on shirts. That then morphed in over the years to everything we know now is in print sportswear for the most part. Okay, it all started with a guy in a garage spray painting t-shirts. Okay, that turned into uh, uh, screen printing. Screen printing was around before a little bit, but not like it, like we see it now. Anyway, so Tom was Ed's uh, was a, was mentored by Ed. Tom was then came on my partner. Okay, once West Coast Airbrush came on, which basically took everything that Tom knew, everything that I had gained over the years of being on my own in Panama City Beach, uh, just a lot of evolution. Uh, but it, it, my dad was quite a promoter, a mall manager, quite a promoter. A lot of people call him like a P.T. Barnum kind of thing. And I think Sam Walton also said, Bill, stack them high and wash them by. P.T. Barnum was make it big and make it flashy and so get it, you know, bill it and they will come kind of thing. Okay, so my whole thing was making things big and more flashy and so forth. And so instead of having a little airbrush setup like a lot of people in Florida did at the beginning, they may have like a table and like six designs on the wall and they just kind of, people come in and tell you what they want it. And that's how I started. But then within no time at all, I would just had 30 designs on the wall and a display and a nice counter. That turned in over time to a booth that basically was about 2,000 square feet with televisions, cameras pointing on us in the 80s, okay? And, uh, and a staff of artists, a staff of helpers, a, a 20 by 12 foot billboard on the top of our building, flashing lights in Panama City Beach, which was overrun with our perfect customer at the time, which was you know, Southern folks that just loved this art form at the time. And uh, they couldn't escape it. So then that whole thing turned into the mall thing next, which you had to be more refined with it because now you're in a shopping mall. It has to look more like a clothing store, but not so gaudy. But nevertheless, you still have all the color and all the flash and all the stuff that attracts people. And it's different. It's unique. Okay. So then over time that refines itself as you learn more about shopping malls you get a lot of input from shopping mall managers and and merchandising people in the malls who tell you well do this or do that or ever thought about this kind of merchandising display apparatus or that uh, it, it just evolves over a long period of time and um, so the evolution of it happened just happened I saw an interview with you with a with a um, voice no a yeah I think a voiceover. Uh, Joe Bianco voiceover. was his name. Yes, and uh, he said it all just kind of happened, and you used a a similar thing of the Eagles, where Joe Walsh just said it all just kind of happened, right? Uh, it all just kind of happened. It just luckily I was brought up by parents that were in retail. And it all just kind of made sense to me. It all just kind of clicked as I went along. And then you just build one thing on top of another thing. And it was just stuff that other people weren't doing. However, a lot of the reason I was doing what I was doing was because of the people I was working with, because they got on board with me and they helped and they input. And all together, cooperatively, we evolved it towards the direction it is now and made it big and nice and clean and look good and you know, and there was a lot of people who didn't do it that way, though. Uh, airbrushing could have been presented much better, uh, wholly, but there was only a few people that were doing it totally correctly, like more like a business. And we just happened to be those people. And there's others too, but we were certainly one of them. And that's and you, you came into focus for me in, in the late 80s 
because you wrote articles for the trade magazine for Airbrush Action Magazine. And you were, you were very, like, you were the guy that I saw and I went, this dude's put together. He knows his stuff. He's, he's a CEO business type of artist. And, and your articles really talked about that, about, I mean, you would share designs and, you know, that was part of the wheelhouse, but you would also share your your setup in the malls like you would you would and even now i see that you're like sharing blueprints for things like you're giving it away and you've been very generous and that's been a a cool part of who you are well we all want our art form to succeed whether it be through the art to help other uh, other artists with tips and so forth on our art side of it but at the same time, I want it to succeed through the business side of it. Because ultimately what we do is a business. I don't think we're ever going to see an airbrush t-shirt end up in a museum someplace someday or hailed as a piece of art, unless it was painted by Von Dutch or Ed Roth. Those, those very well sure. should end up in a museum for Americana, right? Okay. But this isn't. This is a business. The airbrush t-shirt painter that dies with the most money wins it's just pretty much that simple <laughs> now getting there you certainly want to be nice to people you certainly want to have good myth of ethics all those things that you have as a proper business person okay but let's say all that stuff's in place then you're good the, the airbrush action magazine luckily for me was a good uh, vehicle for me to to be so share those ideas and those ways of doing things not knowing necessarily where it was going to lead but what happened was because it all started so early, we're talking about in the, in the mid eighties when airbrush action came along. And I, I was chosen given the opportunity by Cliff Stieglitz, the, the publisher of the magazine to write for the magazine on the business aspects of airbrushing. Cause I wasn't, we, we, we did a lot of articles on, on art as well, but our, my focus mainly was on the business side of it. So given that we influenced a lot of people, and they then took things that we did and applied them in their businesses. And then when people came to work for them or friends of theirs, then would take those same ideas and they would apply them. Over the years, that just kept going. So whether a lot of people know it or not, the, the things that they're using or the way they're doing things all started over time reading those articles in that magazine. And so when I get new people to work with our cooperative group here in, in Orlando, we, they, they're doing things the same way that we do. Well, that's because it, it connects all back to all those articles and airbrush action about business. So luckily for me, everybody's doing it like I do it, kind of sort of, because that's where they got it to begin with. They just don't even know it. Now, I have to be very humble in the fact that I didn't come up with all these things. It was many, many people that I worked with, many people that influenced me, that, uh, that lent their expertise and their their evolution to me. I was the the vessel that kind of wrote it down, along with things that I came up with as well, too, of course. But nevertheless, it all got written down somewhere, and people prospered from it. And now I'm prospering from it because everybody kind of does it the same way. Because that was kind of the Bible of airbrush airbrushing, airbrush action. So everybody, if you're listening right now, you're hearing Walmart is closing. This is after hours uh at at the shop so that's that's the stuff going on in the background what do you think an artist needs to know to to start making a living from what it is they do well first off you have to want to do it second off you have to do it that's the other thing self-employment doesn't happen just from thinking about it You, you have to do it okay and that's the big thing Okay, uh, airbrush t-shirt painting by somebody who's an artist to begin with is not hard. It just takes a lot of practice. If you're a good fine artist, you can be a good t-shirt painter. You can get, be a good airbrush artist. Uh, but you just have to basically put one foot in front of the other and do it. I was having a discussion this evening with a fellow from Argentina just a few hours before I talked to you. And he's wanting to get started. He did it before I when he was younger. And he wants to do it again now. And he had ideas, but you know, just didn't have a lot of money to put it together. And I told him, I said, well, I said, I said, you have an idea of where you want to put it. And he goes, well, I, there's the market that I can do it in. It's, it's kind of like a, 
I think, kind of like a artist market where there's different artists set up in the, inside this building. And in the front of the building, there's a big window. He said, I could set up on this window, a lot of street traffic to get people, you know, and it'd be a good place. I said, but he says, I don't know if I have enough money to rent this spot. And I said, well, talk to the owner of the building and say you're, and this is, this is retail entertainment, what you're doing. I said, does anybody else in the space do anything there or like they make it in front of people? Like there's a jury person making jury. No, they just, they'd sell what they already have made. And I said, well, you're, you entertain people while you're doing it. So you need to set up in the front of this building in front of this big window. So when people walk by, they see you painting and they'll come in and they'll look because you draw them into the business. And then what, once they're in, they may get stuff from you, but they're inside the place now. And this is the biggest deal, trying to get people inside the place, okay, come in. And once they're in now, they see all this other stuff in the space. And, they, and, they'll, and they'll look at that stuff too. And everybody will prosper from you being in front of the store. So pitch yourself as a retail entertainment. You're going to be the person that's going to draw people into the space. They're missing this now. They don't even understand that's even part of what you do. And... Then you get your space for little to nothing, maybe because you're drawing people into space. And maybe the owner of the building would like to go in with you as a partner in your business. Maybe he'll buy the shirts. Maybe he'll buy your supplies. Maybe he'll put you into business, even. You never know. You know, but you don't know unless you ask, and you don't know unless you put your foot in front of the other and, and just do it. But the big a lot of people succeed in faking it till you make it. And nobody realized you're faking it until you have made it. So, I mean, seriously, there, how many people do that? I have, you know. Well, at uh, some point, you have to, you have to, do, like you said, you got to do it. And the only way it. you can figure out what you don't know how to do is, is to come up against the obstacle <laughs> in the moment. Listen, there's only so many seminars and so many mentors you can have and pay to do whatever and if it's a hobby fine but if it's not a hobby you better get on with doing it yeah and uh we used to sell this package of designs and so forth and stencils we call it the west coast airbrush design and training portfolio it's a t-shirt shop in a box kind of training this is back in the 80, late 80s and early 90s and i told people when they bought it would if you don't open the box it's never going to work you know and if you open the box and don't on and on and on right yeah but the ones that succeeded and did it like i told them to it, they succeeded at it and and then it's just how much passion they put behind it to continue it being a success right so um, but there you go so but it's a it's a good thing yeah and it's easy tell me what what were the Maybe, maybe you've got one, maybe you've got a few. What were the biggest problems for you to overcome when you started? Uh, <laughs> I don't think any of it was very hard. Uh, I mean, seriously, this is the easiest thing in the world as far as a business to do. It's stupid easy. You, you have, it's a, it's a, with artists, a lot of times managing artists or getting artists together in, a, in one space, the emotional people, you, you, you need to be able to get along. Uh, there's, a, there's a soap opera that happens in any business place, but when you get artists together, it's, it's, it's kind of, sometimes it's another thing. So maybe getting over the personal relationships with other people and then getting them to understand how, how great we have what we do and it's not really work. So let's not screw it up by being too emotional all the time and, and making things big out of the mountain out of a molehill, you know. So that, I think, is the biggest thing. I, I've always said that the biggest thing that will screw up an airbrush T-shirt shop is somebody who leaves a half drink and cup of Coke on the counter and then throws it in the trash without emptying it. And then the other person comes and takes it out the trash and leaks Coke all the way to the dumpster. That stuff there, or, an, or a half-eaten sandwich or a hamburger wrapper, those are the things that screw up everything. It's not the big stuff. Yeah. It's all the little stuff that get on people's nerves. So, and we have artists, right? So yeah. I'm trying to make excuses for artists. You know, I think we always make excuses for ourselves. I'm an artist. <laughs> Give me a break. 
<laughs> I yeah, I think I, I, and I think that that, that kind of, oh, the, the stereotypical art, artist thing is it, it's, it's lazy. I've always found it to be kind of lazy. It's easy to go, well, I'm emotional. And so I can act this way. So that, that's the excuse for my behavior. It turns, into a, it turns into a stereotype. Yeah. And, and that's, that's wrong because some, then some people then take it and run with it. You know, yeah. Cause I can't. Right. But no, it's yeah. like any other business. You have to be, you have to work. Right. Uh, there, I, I said, it's easy. It is. But at the same time, we're doing what I love. So consequently, hard work doesn't really seem like hard work. Right. Uh, and but it is hard work. You know, we stand at these at these easels for, you know, 10, 12 hours a day, nonstop, paint hundreds of shirts, uh, deal with customers all day long. Uh, you know, and, and that that just dealing with customers by itself is enough sometimes. Yeah. Now you're trying to create something for them and for them to like it. And um uh, and then be able to do this day after day after day for months on end in the summertime in Orlando. Most people don't even come to Orlando just because they don't like the crowds. Can you imagine being a clerk in Orlando in the summertime and yeah. having to deal with people who maybe aren't happy about something? And you have to be highly relational. You have to be you know, able to deliver. You have to be able to uh, understand and maybe coax out of somebody what it is that they really want. So the expectations are understood and met. Right. It, it, it really does kind of go on and on. Getting back to the, how to start. Okay. Uh, so I don't, I think I didn't quite explain that enough. Sure. The airbrush shirt painting can be done as a botechnical kind of thing. We, I, I tried to get a botechnical programs uh, curriculum to, to do in schools at one point in my career. Uh, taught a class at a high school for about a year uh, to, to develop it. Uh, thinking that the technical, that, that airbrushing could be offered as a technical, technical program, no different than building trades or auto mechanics, but taking kids who have an art and inclined to art towards something that they could make money doing. Uh, because I saw a lot of kids basically put in art classes just as a place to stick people, kind of like a babysitting service in high schools. They, the, the counselors don't know where else to put these kids, so they put them in art class. And that's not fair to the art teacher to begin with. And then at the same time, let's do something that they can actually take and make money from. Airbrush t-shirting, shirt, t-shirt painting can be done anywhere. You certainly can. You, if you have people, you can plop an airbrush t-shirt painter down in the middle of anywhere and you will make money. It's just that simple. It's that, it's that intriguing and unique and popular with people. Uh, so in that regard, if somebody wants to do it, they simply just have to learn, get all the information they can. Thank God for YouTube. Now there's no limit to how much they can see and then get their airbrushes, get their paint compressors, get on Facebook, go into the different groups, ask a billion questions, dumbest, whatever, it don't matter. Everybody will answer. Everybody's nice. Give you all the input you want. And then just go out to a local arts and crafts fair, a uh, festival, uh, a fair, any of these things, and just set up. And it costs a couple hundred bucks or 50 bucks or whatever. And I guarantee you at the, at the, end, of this, at the end of maybe four or five of these things, you'll be coming away with a $500 or a thousand bucks. And, and you'll think, why didn't that start this long time ago? I'm not saying it's quit your job, but at the same time, it's a great supplemental income that people can make just doing airbrush t-shirts because it is popular. And you can couple that with, uh, with uh, airbrush tattoos, airbrush face painting, which is hugely popular. Once again, it's all over the internet that you can get all the supplies and so forth. One of the biggest art supply stores for face painting is in uh, Sevierville, Tennessee, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Uh, you can couple all that stuff together and I, I'm telling you that you could make a living from it very easily if you if you want to. Uh, there's, it's just it's all just with a little airbrush, and you know people just don't realize how much you could do with this. And it's simple, and it doesn't cost very much. You can put together an airbrush operation and go to a festival for several thousand dollars, and you're in business. You pay it back in a month. Yeah, it, it's amazing. The paint is so reasonably priced and it goes a long way and Eric a lot of times complain about the cost of airbrush paint well that's 
the dumbest thing in the world because you equate how much money you make from an ounce of paint. Yeah. It's the best investment anybody ever made. Yep. So, so it's, it's a, it's a good thing. Airbrush t-shirt painting is a good thing. And there could be an airbrush t-shirt painter in every single County of every single and every and all the United States and going to all their local festivals and fairs and all that stuff. And everybody would just be as happy as bugs in a row. No, they would just do it. Now you're, I mean, you're a real entrepreneur because you, you know, you don't just have the stores, which in and of themselves is, is a huge um, uh, undertaking and a huge payoff, but you, you have other interests as well, right? So, so what else do you do? Well, I have had, I don't now. This is, this is the, this is the end game, John. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, this, we have this now between my partner and myself, that it pretty much is on cruise control. Uh, we could, we can't walk away from it necessarily, but it's, it's, it's close. Okay. Maybe partly because mostly because of the great staff we have, the great cooperative artists we have uh, that are self-employed subcontractor artists who basically could run it without us. Okay. But, uh, that being said, uh, we, the, the other businesses I've been in over the years have been just things that I've been completely interested in. I get bored with things quickly within about a decade of doing anything. I just want to basically, it, it succeeded. I didn't know anything about any of these things. I just decided that I wanted to go do it. And so, but the learning part process was what I was had fun with. I got wanted to learn how to shoot off fireworks. So we started a firework company basically and the organization that we then set on the path to do public firework displays just so we could be a Beavis and Butthead and shoot off to make, you know, blow up stuff. So, so one, one pretty crazy example, but, but uh, yeah. But that's how all these different businesses come to pass was I just was interested in them, started them, spent money thinking that it would work, build it and they will come once like this stuff I said earlier about, you know, my dad being PT Barnum type guy. And you just have a lot of confidence that you'll make it and then you just do it. And then it usually works if it, yeah. if you have to have a common sense, you know, about what will work and what won't work. And, uh, and then, of course, you have to have uh, a lot of confidence in yourself that it will work. And how, it, how, do you find, how do you find common sense and how do you find <laughs> confidence? <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. Uh, maybe you're born with it, I guess. Uh, I don't know how you get common sense, but I know how you get confidence. You basically do things and, and it works, so then you build confidence over time. Common sense, I think you're just, it's just genetics, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. But I wonder, I, common sense to me, it's almost like you, you, you look at an alligator with an open mouth and you go, I'm not going <laughs> to put my hand in there. And maybe the next level of common sense is, so look, that alligator's got his mouth open and you put your hand in it and it bites you. And then the next time you go, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> you're going to fail. And failing is part of it, but failing with a good intent, you know, with common sense is okay. Yeah. Failing just because you put your hand in the alligator's mouth just to see if it's going to bite you. That's not, that's not failing. That's just dumb. So, so embrace uh, failure as a way to learn, as a way oh to, to improve. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's, uh, I've been lucky enough not to fail big, but I had a bazillion little failures. Yeah, that all led to evolving it away from those failures, um, and I'm just lucky, I guess. Luck enters into it a lot too, John. I mean, yeah, you know, who you meet, who you know, things that just happen. Dumb luck. The best thing I ever did in my life was completely dumb luck. It just happened, and uh, and thus that funded a lot of things I did later in life through business. Was just the uh, like our. Like I said earlier, I mentioned this airbrush design portfolio that we sold. I was just satisfied that people would want to come uh, take lessons from me personally, spend a week with me. I would take them around to our stores to show them the ins and outs firsthand of things rather than 
you know, trying to uh, take him to a class someplace and learn. I wanted to go out and actually do it. Okay. And uh, so I, we, Airbrush Action and myself started an Airbrush Action getaway, Airbrush Action training center. And we brought six students in at a time. And then they would then go around to our stores that were in the area. And they'd have training, and then they would leave for, with, uh, we had a mock store set up, so basically it was a retail store, but it wasn't open to the public, it was just a mock store. So they would come in and take their lessons there. And then we would have visiting artists come in that were on my staff that came in and taught whatever their expertise was, portraits or whatever. And um, so, so we did that for several sessions. And if I had one person that called wanting to come and take that class, I had a hundred people called and said, you know, I can't really come for like the time is all said and done. I'll spend 10 days. My wife won't let me leave for 10 days. Can you just have something I can just buy and send it to me? I said, no, no, you can't do that. You've got to come to this class. It's the only way it's going to work, so on and so forth. Well, after a year of telling people that and a, and a thousand people telling me they couldn't come to the class, my idea and then telling me they want me to make something up that i can send it to them on videotape i finally just threw up my hand and said okay forget it I, i'll do it you know so i videotaped this whole thing on 17 hours of video had all the designs that we had all the stencils and so forth a book that had all this writing in it you know of all the different business strategies business plans layouts store layouts so on and so forth put this together in a box and sold it and we sold thousands and thousands of them. And who knew? But it was from people just, you know, just yelling at me saying, I can't come to what you want to do. I want this. And I finally listened to them. And I finally then did what they wanted. And that turned into 20 other products, uh, full page ads in Airbrush Action Magazine that promoted all this stuff. And, uh, which then gave me a way to monetize the articles I was writing in Airbrush Action, which gave me more reason to write them and, and then also open more stores and it continued to evolve the business so I'd have stuff to write about, which then would share that information with people and want them to learn more from me. It, it led to all of that. Who knew? And, and it was the best thing I ever did in my whole life as far as uh, a business goes. And it was all basically me kicking and screaming all the way, not wanting to do it. So it was just dumb luck that <laughs> I did it. Had I not, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. No, Probably. no. Right. So you it's... don't always know what you don't know. And, yeah. And you have to listen hard and see things. And that's one time I didn't see it. Yeah. But, but, uh, but luckily I... I think I think for those of us who are a little bit older, uh, maybe maybe we're a, a little bit more uh, humbled by life, maybe a little bit more open to opportunity. What do you think it is that that enables us to see things differently than when we're younger? Well, experience, life yeah. experiences, age, so forth. It's something that happens to your brain as you get older, I think that basically just first off makes you far more easy to get along with. Uh, you don't care as much you, you, as in stuff. You, you see things more clearly. There's a lot of good things about getting older. Uh, I'm 65 and to be quite honest, I'm happier now than I've probably ever been in my whole life because I'm just more calm about stuff. You just don't take things so seriously. But at the same time, it all gels easier. And and then when your partners or co business colleagues, because all my airbrush artists, or most of them are in their late 40s, 160, the rest of them are in their 50s for the most part. I have a few younger ones, but, but um, and they're all in the same, they're all in the same mode. So we all get along great just because we're all basically in the long further in life. Um, the, the younger ones are a little bit more like, you know, freaked out all the time about whatever right so um so did that answer your question i think so i think so i think the, i think that the answer might be you just kind of settle a bit as you get older 
Yo, he's, yeah, he's settled. Yeah. You're not rattled as much. You've seen it. You know, you know that the sun's going to come up tomorrow. Okay, I'll fix it later. Yep. Oh, yes. All the above. Yeah. Ditto. Yeah. Right. Got it. Yeah. I think between what I said and what you just said, we got it covered. Woo. Right. Yeah, absolutely. We just cured, yeah. we just took care of that. Right. So, yeah. No, th things are getting easier. There's no question. Yeah. Is, but now is, there's, but when you get to be 65, now there's another, there's an, you're, you're, you're headed into the next, the next stage of your life, retirement. And then you try to basically walk back away from work. And that from being a self-employed person your whole life, which gives in the, in the professions I've been, which gives you joy, that is hard to not have something else. Well, this is what I'm going to do when I retire because I just can't sit around. This isn't anything new. I mean, everybody goes through this. Uh, so that's my next thing is seeing. I think in my case, it'll be teaching somehow. The good thing about this new, you know what? I mean, there's some good things that came out of this whole COVID thing. Uh, what we're doing right now through the internet working with, you know, we can work with vast number of people at once on a Zoom, for example. But those things weren't quite so obvious before to everybody. And now they will be, and it'll be very common. So I think we can open the doors to some training and so forth that I can lend some of my experience uh, in, that I've learned along and also this thing I'm doing now. So I think that's what I'll do going forward is do a little bit more teaching and stuff like that. So, but you have to keep going and do something, right? So the stages of life is where we're at. Uh, I do. I do want to say that that we are uh, taking applications for people, airbrush t-shirt artists, to join our our crew here in Orlando. Uh, we uh, are going to start building our staff back to full force coming this spring. And if anybody's interested in applying, uh, they can certainly get a hold of me via mess Facebook Messenger, uh, and we can talk about details. But yeah. Fantastic. I'll be right there. I'm packing my bags. <laughs> it's, it's a good gig, John. <laughs> <laughs> it sure is. So uh, do you have any parting words of wisdom for any creatives out there who are looking to, to make a living from what it is that they create? I, I've, always, I've always said, just do it. I mean, it's a, it's a ripoff from Nike. I get it. Yeah. But nevertheless, it's true. You, you, you just have to move forward. Any entrepreneur, any person that's never been self-employed uh, thinks they can't get by unless they have a paycheck every week from somebody, you know. But there are opportunities that you can do on your own. You just have to do it. Don't jump in with both feet to begin with. You know, take it slow. But as you work towards it, then you'll make the decision whether or not you can do things full time. And, uh, and that would be your direction. Uh, you have to... Uh, always know what the people want and then try to accommodate uh, whether it be you know what we do fine art music and so forth but you I mean you can go off on your own and do whatever you want you're probably less likely to be successful at it but, but art is you know is one of those kind of thing I'm coming from a business standpoint you have to understand when I'm saying this okay but uh, but that's what we're talking about is business of art and so that's where I'm coming from. Uh, so you just have to do it and, and then find something people want and, and do what they want. And if you do, they'll, they'll probably reciprocate and you'll be successful. And then you can go off and do what you want on your own over here on the corner. And maybe someday you'll get famous doing that and make a bazillion dollars. But in the meantime, you got to make a living. So you do have to kind of, okay, what do they want? Let's do that over here. But the main thing, and then over here, let's do our little thing and see if it works. And if it doesn't, well, we'll be happy doing that. But we're making money over here doing this. That makes us happy too. So, fantastic. Thanks so much, Pat. Thanks for being my guest. You rock. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. I appreciate your time tonight and everything you're doing with this podcast. It, I'm sure it really does affect and give everybody a lot of, a lot of insight. And I appreciate it. Uh, thanks, man. Cheers. Pat, thanks again for being my guest. I really appreciate uh, just uh, your everything you shared about your journey. I mean, there's so much that I learned from your interview. 
it's a master class in, in taking a craft, an art, a focus in a particular niche and turning it into something uh, more, turning it into a business that you can really earn from. And, you know, to have the uh, smarts to see the opportunity um, of opening up these airbrush shops, not just in the malls, but to partner with Walmart, you know, uh, and, and in a, uh, high volume traffic areas is just so, so smart. And I hear a fearlessness in you. That's another takeaway that you weren't afraid to take chances where you saw opportunity. You know, when we see opportunity, it doesn't mean that everything is just going to go smoothly. There's work to be done and, and hard work a lot of the time. And you've got to, you've got to be, you know, digging and mining for what is the system and what is the location and where should it be and how should it go and where's the help and there's a lot of work that goes into it and I think that you've made it look very simple um, but I, I just love that there's a um, you know a fearlessness in regard to uh, seeing the opportunity and stepping into it and embracing it like an adventure uh, I see Pat you know not just loving his artwork but you know, really loving being an entrepreneur, loving the opportunity that comes from, you know, owning and operating a shop and uh, collaborating with others. Uh, it's unusual, you know, to, to see somebody who is that comfortable, not just in collaborating, but in handing out compliments to his team. So, uh, that's that's really, really cool stuff. I'm, I'm really uh, grateful you're on the show, Pat, and, uh, you know, I'm grateful to call you a friend now, uh, and I'm looking forward to, to getting to know you better. And so, you know, I'd encourage all of you out there to take Pat at his word that, you know, you can make a living airbrushing t-shirts for sure. It's, it's maybe one of the easiest arts to, to, uh, you know, turn into money. Um, and by easy, I don't mean I don't mean it's simple. I mean, if you can, if you can master the art of airbrushing to a degree, you'll certainly find a, a market for it. People like juicy, bright looking airbrush t-shirts. There's just something magical about them. And if you can do it in an area where there are a lot of people, you know, which is maybe a little harder, right? In this COVID era, but you can start working on your skills now to get to the point where, where you could do that. Um, I've just had a lot of success myself when I had been airbrushing t-shirts, uh, to, to experience that. So I can back up what Pat says. I have not done it to the degree that Pat has done it, but, um, it's, uh, it's a good business. So, so there you have it. On behalf of the Breakthrough Creative, I want you to go out there and I want you to figure out how to make a living from your creativity and what you do and what you create. And it's doable. You can do it. Okay. So, so go out there and start working at it because it doesn't just happen by dreaming about it. You've got to get in there and, and work at it. Okay. So uh, I wish you the best and I'll see you next time.